Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth and final webinar in our series, COVID-19 in Context, News Coverage and News Literacy in Uncertain Times. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Executive Director of the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island, and we're so glad you could join us today. This four-part webinar series has brought together journalists, news literacy education experts, and scientists to explore the science communication challenges posed by COVID-19. Each of the webinars is available on Metcalf Institute's YouTube channel, and we'll share that link in the chat. We are bringing you these webinars in partnership with the News Literacy Project, a nonpartisan national education nonprofit that provides educators with tools and resources to teach their students how to navigate today's complex information landscape, learn to judge the credibility of information for themselves, and become engaged and informed participants in our democracy. Metcalf Institute's mission is to engage diverse audiences in conversations about science and the environment through webinars like this and providing education, training, and resources for journalists, scientists, and other science communicators. On behalf of Metcalf Institute, I'd like to thank the Ruth and Hal Launders Charitable Trust for supporting this webinar series. So we've all experienced the unprecedented challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, from our personal health, both physical and mental, to our social networks and society at large. This disease is testing our governance, our public health, and our economic systems. As we all try to come to terms with and make sense of the daunting scientific uncertainties about the virus, we're also facing one of the most urgent science communication challenges of our time. The COVID-19 pandemic has ushered in unprecedented challenges. And oops, that's a repeat of the things I just said. So let me just keep moving on. Um, but what I did wanna say is there are fundamental scientific uncertainties about transmission of the virus itself, as well as why the symptoms of COVID-19 present so differently among different people and many, many other uncertainties. These scientific uncertainties spin up into broader societal uncertainties that affect our personal interactions, our livelihoods, and the broader economy. Today's webinar is entitled, Countering Misinformation in a Crisis, Making Sense of Science. We have an excellent panel of speakers who will help us understand how to make sense of scientific uncertainty and how you, as a consumer of information, can use this understanding to counter misinformation. Our first speaker today is Dr. Laisha Palin, who is a professor and founding chair of the Department of Information Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Professor Palin is a leader in the area of crisis informatics, an area she forged with her graduate students at Colorado. She conducts empirical research in the interpretivist tr tradition using both quantitative and qualitative techniques to study online interactions. Professor Palin is the author of over 90 articles in crisis informatics and other areas of human computer interaction. She's been awarded $5 million as principal investigator in grants from the National Science Foundation for this research. And she was also awarded the 2015 ACM Computer Human Interaction Social Impact Award. Following Dr. Palin's remarks, we'll hear from Dr. C. Brandon Obunu, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Brown University. Professor Obunus's research takes place at the intersection between computational biology, evolution, and epidemiology, making him very well suited to comment on this particular crisis. In addition, Professor Obunu occupies several spaces at the interface between science and culture as a writer, lecturer, and storyteller. He has written about a range of topics, including misinformation, artificial intelligence, race, and epidemics for many venues, including Wired Magazine, ESPN's The Undefeated, The Conversation, and The Boston Review. And finally, we'll hear from Susana Gonzalez, the Associate Director of Education at the News Literacy Project, where she co-writes a weekly newsletter called The SIFT and helps to develop new resources. Before joining the News Literacy Project, Susanna worked in journalism for more than 20 years, including as a Chicago-based correspondent at Reuters and as a reporter at the Austin American Statesman 
the St. Petersburg Times, and the Providence Journal. I'm especially pleased to note that she was the first recipient of Metcalf Institute's 10-month Environmental Reporting Fellowship, during which she worked at Rhode Island's NPR station. So at this point, I'm really happy to turn this over to Dr. Palin, who's going to offer some remarks about information science in this crazy moment. So I'll just stop sharing and turn this over to you, Dr. Palin. Okay, great. Can you hear me and see me? Wonderful. Okay. Um, so, um, so as an information scientist, I study the social life of information. So I examine information ecosystems and why they come to be collectively what they are. In particular, I study disasters and have been studying them for the past 15 years. And to that end, I've helped develop this field that as Sunshine introduced called crisis informatics, which is a multidisciplinary area of study combining computer science with social science knowledge of disasters and collective behavior to understand how people digitally respond in creative ways to cope with uncertainty. Um, the, the field uses a range of methods that you find with social science. Uh, in the particular form of it in, that I do, um, many people think of it as a kind of digital ethnography, which is to say that one has to first engage with the, as a participant observer in the space to understand what the contours of the information space are, to then drive towards empirical questions that then combine quantitative analyses to scope the area of concern and then investigate it deeply and qualitatively. And so it's those kind of that initial phase of trying to grapple with what the contours are of this information environment for the pandemic of 2020, which is just a huge information space as you can under, as you can imagine, as you are experiencing. And it's those ideas that I'd like to share with you today um, to, in the hopes that the way I'm making sense of this event might help others make sense of this event um, and maybe become an adaptable kind of resource for thinking about how, explaining to ourselves how things are emerging as they continue to emerge over the months ahead. So I'd like to offer three ideas um, um, that I think dominate my thinking around this. So the first is that we are dealing with a new hazard effectively every day and that data analytics number two are therefore a central part of the event to, to apprehend the hazard. And then three, this pursuit creates an onslaught of information, but also a dearth or scarcity of information. And I think that's another feature of the infodemic that we don't talk about very much, but I think is very helpful to understanding what it is that we're facing. So I'll talk about these three, um, these three ideas now in more detail. So what do I mean when I say this pandemic differs from other kinds of natural hazards because it acts as a new hazard every day? So what we have in this hazard are, are two elements that are unknown to us. One is the virus, right, which is we're learning more and more, but it's still pretty unknown. And it's inhabited in people. And people, as you know, do unknown things. They change their behavior from day to day. Um, and so this has, I think of this hazard as a composite of these two variables that are always changing and therefore always changing the risk of the hazard. So this together creates a kind of chronic uncertainty because we can't isolate the hazard, we can't control it, therefore. It exists, it doesn't exist outside of us, like we can't see the storm of the hurricane or the destruction of the earthquake. It exists within us and it's a part of our very own behaviors that we engage in. So, okay, so the hazard is new every day and therefore we're trying to, we're pursuing it constantly, we're trying to apprehend it constantly. It is also, unlike these other hazards I cited, but the hurricane storm, the earthquake, it's virtually invisible, right? For the most part, it's invisible. Um, and so it needs to be made invisible in some way to us. And I would argue that it's mostly represented as a data construct or a data representation. So it, it, and it comes in the form of data analysis of data we already have, we, we've collected, or simulated data, future scenarios, models, scenarios, simulations, graphs, um, that come to represent what we think might happen based on different variables about what people do. So, um, and these models are, uh, 
they model epidemic behavior and so therefore they are population models. We think of them, I think of them as, as capturing what the collective impact is because and therefore it's a collective risk. So in this, what I'd like to do now is jump just a little bit to what this means about risk communication and why risk communication is so hard in this event. So the models we have are about collective risk and yet we must understand as individuals what our part is and what we are to do. So we have to think about our individual action. This is in an ideal world. Think about our individual action in relation to the impact on collective risk. Now, this is a really hard balance to strike, right? I mean, I, I think it's quite hard to do. Um, and even when it's done well, there are missteps. And I think it's easy to criticize the missteps, but let's instead think about tune our ears to how those missteps happen in kind of a micro way. So um, I let's turn to examples in the US. So I think of three that there of three distinct phases in the risk communication of this event. And I mean, once we've come to accept that there actually is a hazard. So not in February and January, where we were sort of in denial about this going on. But when we really started to come to understand there is in fact a risk here, and we started receiving formal risk communication, formal warnings about the hazard. So in the beginning, the hazard, I would argue, was framed by and large as, an, as one that was asked us to perceive our individual risk and take individual responsibility, much like what we hear when we're in a hurricane evacuation scenario or a wildfire evacuation scenario. And so if you recall, what we heard was that elders are at risk and young people are not. Young people seem to be fine. Um, and this was based on early data coming out of China. Um, mostly. And so in those early, that early week um, in March, I was getting calls from reporters who were, would ask me to comment on basically how upsetting it was to see young adults on the beaches of Florida enjoying their spring break. And though I disliked it, and if I were somehow 20 again, I, I would not be on the beaches of Florida doing the same thing. I, I was not at all surprised by the behavior. First of all, it was pretty early in the whole the whole experience. And second, they were doing exactly what the risk communication asked them to do, which was to assess their own individual risk and move forward. And they assessed their risk and they felt that they were willing to take on whatever risk was coming upon them, just like those who refused to evacuate in, in a hurricane. So it's, I just didn't think it was all that surprising and consistent with the messaging that was actually going out. Then we very soon switched to a collective framing of risk which I think was best encapsulated by the flatten the curve campaign. And note that that itself, the flatten the curve, is a reference to an abstraction, uh, a reference to a data abstraction of an XY axis with a curve, encouraging us to dampen the curve by our own individual action so that we don't reach the asymptote of the maximum of the, of the healthcare system capacity. Um, and so those who were either engaging directly with the data analytics and the data models or the abstraction of one through the campaign, that created enough of a critical mass that you then started seeing other campaigns arise based on peer pressure alone. So stay the F home is, was sort of the consequence of, okay, if you're not looking at the data models and the data analytics and you don't understand the flatten the curve because it's a little strange, just stay home, would you? And so then you started seeing that peer pressure come in. And what I would say once again um, is that that was a surprisingly effective phase. And that is a little bit contrary to how other people describe this phase. I once again got calls saying, why aren't more people staying inside? And what about the misinformation they're hearing? And, and that's all there and that's all true. And I care about that a lot, but I was absolutely gobsmacked at how much compliance there was for people to change their lives so utterly from anything they've ever known, from anything generations before us have ever known, to give up so, so, so very much and stay inside. So just, in a, just, just a way to say that the collective, the messaging around risk communication was aligned with this idea of collective risk. And now we're in a new, in, entering a new phase in risk communication in, in the US again, 
um, where there's a return to an assumption of individual responsibility of risk. So as more states are starting to open up, we're starting to see a shift in the discourse again, in the narrative again, then the models aren't changing. In fact, they're getting worse. We're seeing numbers actually go up based on some um, what was previously underreporting, and now some assumptions that there's going to be more contagion as we start mingling together. But for example, in the in Colorado, where I live, um, you know, just last week we were still under a stay at home order, which was a very it was a mandate, but it was also very is also oriented towards the collective. And now we are in the safer at home phase, and that is as you can just hear it, it's giving away to individual choice individual discretion, individual uh, responsibility towards understanding the collective risk. And I think that's actually going to be a very difficult thing because they don't reconcile the individual and the collective risk very, very well. So now I'm on to my third point, um, which is that all this is, you know, so if, if the hazard is new every day, we are searching for new information every day and people are happily producing it for us, it seems. Um, and uh, and, and then we still must continue to grapple with it. So old information ages out really fast. If the hazard is new every day, then yesterday's hazard was yesterday's hazard. And so now we have an accumulation of what was previously good information or the best we could hope for. And it may no longer be good simply because it's stale, simply because it's old. And a great example of this is just even all the communication around mask use in the US. You know, that was what was once good information is actually now terrible information. And that itself, that information itself came from formal sources. And so this, this also increases the opportunity, the windows of opportunity for bad information to enter. This uncertainty is chronic, disaster fatigue is certainly setting, settling in. We may be willing to listen to other sources or not to question our sources. And it seems that some sources seem to be willing to say things that aren't true as well. So we're seeing a kind of degradation of all this with this chronic uncertainty and disaster fatigue. So, I would argue that we feel even more lost in a sea of increasingly useless information because the percentage of old information and bad information from the past is so much larger, it's ever larger to the new information that occurs just today. And that's why it feels like information overload. But I would also argue that we don't really understand the information space of the disaster without this other conceptual point of view, this kind of yin and yang um, kind of positioning of this idea, which is to also recognize that we are in a state of inf information scarcity or information dearth or an information desert, as some people call it. Um, and um, it's not unlike Coolidge's ancient mariner who mourns water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Um, and it's to, it's to say that we don't understand the disaster in front of us. We still don't have that thing that we need. We're thirsty for the thing that we need, which is to understand that collective risk as it matches to individual risk. And as a friend of mine said, when he heard me explain this to him, he said, oh, info, info everywhere. I don't know what to think. So those are my three points. And if there's time, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we might pull that together. Thank you so much, Leisha. Um, so I so let's start with um, kind of a succinct summary of this. So your three points that I heard are we're dealing with a new hazard every day. Number two, um, we need data analytics to really understand the nature of the hazard. And number three, which I think is the most fascinating piece of this, is we have all of this information but because the information is changing so quickly, we also have a scarcity of information. That's the information that we need. So how would you bring all those three things together as like, what's the most important takeaway message for people? Yeah, so, so for me, the way I think about this is that the main feature that drives this whole information ecosystem and all the things that we do, the fundamental kind of concept is that that we have a constant need for risk communication. And by risk communication, I'm talking about mostly that warning period information, mm -hmm. but it's not like a hurricane in warning stage ends. We are in from beginning to end, we are gonna be in a constant state of warning. Um, and that's because we're always apprehending the hazard. 
And so um, risk communication is actually what I think of as this informational centerpiece to this whole event and that we're all reacting to and organizing around, often dysfunctionally, but that we're all organizing around that. Right, great, thank you very much. Um, so, okay, so we're gonna move on now to our next speaker, which is Dr. Brandon Obunu. And Brandon, take it away. Great, thank you. And thank you, Professor Palin, for your comments. I'm really, really quite privileged to be here. Um, I enter this problem uh, wearing two hats. Uh, one of them is as a basic scientist whose laboratory is involved in COVID-19 related research, mostly in the, in the mathematical and computational modeling world. Um, so contentious have been the issues around misinformation that it's actually influenced the way that my lab conducts its work. So we've actually haven't published things, and we've held on to things for quite some time. So I've been kind of deeply, personally, and scientifically and professionally affected uh, by, by the kind of misinformation, uh, you know, multiverse, if you will. But most importantly, I entered this as a citizen scientist. And I think, independent of what I do for a living, I, I want to be a responsible person. I care deeply about equity and social justice. And I think the key for me is to make these things interact in a useful way. And I think a lot of the, what I'll talk about is about how these two sides don't speak to each other. So like Professor Palin said, the misinformation problem has, been, has plagued COVID-19 from the very beginning. It's been around for quite some time. It's taken on many shapes. And you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the analogy of it being a plague is one that people have used. People say it spreads, information is infectious, and it evolves. And oh, most of the time I'm indifferent to this analogy. I think that we in some ways need to move away from it and kind of move into what is the true engine behind how mis misinformation is spreading. And I'll briefly uh, outline what I see as three main instruments uh, that are kind of driving contagious misinformation. Um, and I've written about this most recently for Wired Magazine in, in some way, shape, or form. The first one is kind of classical charlatanism. The charlatan, this is the non-expert who I say parachutes into the problem and discusses COVID-19 as if they're an expert. This is one that we know about very, very well. There are many high profile cases. Um, oftentimes there's very high profile ones, individuals from Silicon Valley who are tech entrepreneurs or data scientists who decided because they did well in high school calculus that they understand the way an epidemic growth curve works. So this class can range in scope. They're people from, they, they, they can be people who are simply over eager and not necessarily bad people or they can be people who are nefarious. And I think the latter class is individuals who have attempted to be, they're opportunists. They have kind of used this pandemic as an opportunity to build their brands. And I think that's the one we're the least tolerant for. This class is relatively easy to spot and easy to demonize. I think we all know this class, we know who they are. I mean, by and large, uh, but that doesn't mean they are not uh, numerous and very, very, very influential. But I wanna really emphasize that not all of the, the charlatans are necessarily have bad intentions. Um, oftentimes the over eager, so perhaps they have a skill set, maybe they're good at data visualization, maybe they have a company that does something right that they think can lend to make things more clear. Nonetheless, they end up causing problems downstream. The second class is one that's very deeply personal to me, and that is um, that sometimes the, 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 the purveyors of misinformation are themselves experts. And I think we're seeing this emerge a lot most recently. This problem has also been pervasive, but is more challenging to diagnose. And while we might be armed with the language to discuss this now, it took us some time to get here, right? Certainly early on, right? I think what we heard a lot of times were these appeals to, well, trust the experts. And now the experts themselves are trapped, caught in these very, very contentious debates and really have authored misinformation, frankly, that's irresponsible in a lot of ways. I'd say this is a bigger problem because the are not, if you will, of this misinformation is greater. It's a lot more contagious because of credentials. We think people know what they're talking about. But what's especially problematic about this is that it undermines what makes science great, uh, and that is the democracy of ideas. A lot of individuals who are purported experts and run behind their credentials as a reason why we should listen to them are gatekeepers. And they think they are the only ones who can author useful uh, ideas about right, this, this problem, which is false, which is false. And again, undermines what makes scientific inquiry and discussion and discourse uh, such, a, such a good thing. Um, you don't actually need a good degree or to be affiliated with anybody to do anything. And as we've observed, some of the worst, most broken, most anti-scientific ideas are coming from individuals affiliated with very large and prestigious institutions. 
And the last class, the last instrument, if you will, is uh, ignorance and fear. Now, this instrument reads is where we get our classical conspiracy theories, from the infamous 5G hypothesis to more modern ones like the relationship between Bill Gates and the potential vaccine. I haven't quite wrapped my head around that one yet, but this is what I'm hearing now. These sound like the classical quackery right, around most diseases. Now, it's a bit different than the, than the anti-vaxxer stance, and it's related in some ways. It isn't so much aggressively anti-science as much as it is pro-clarity, and I think we can learn from these. I think we are dismissive and flippant to these, these types of conspiracy theories, but I think they teach us, they oftentimes come from communities often who are being affected by the problem and aren't getting the answers and aren't being engaged, and certainly uh, whose policy, who policy is not properly uh, uh, you know, work to address. So how do we combat this type of misinformation? Well, our own radar for detecting it must be highly sensitive, which means we really have to rule out the bad stuff, right? Because it's really, really hard to be able to tell exactly who's the truth, but it's how do we identify bad stuff first? I think that's the key thing. How do you, how do you engage a, an idea or an individual and, and highlight that they, or they're definitely probably wrong, probably they're definitely wrong, whether, whether or not they're right or not takes a little bit more work. Well, Information that is rooted in an explicitly anti-science stance automatically, you know, has to go, right? So if people lead with this, uh, this notion that science doesn't get it right or, or that the process of science is fundamentally broken in this way and therefore can't arrive at understandings, those are the ideas I find that are the easiest ones to root out. Um, and the other ones are ones laden with conflict of interest. Right, and that is if there's a financial interest, or a you know, a, or other kind, or if there's you know, individuals, uh, financial interests are kind of the most pervasive of these. Those are kind of also very, very easy ways to um, to root out uh, ideas. But short of that, there's no magic to diagnosing misinformation. I think improving our own basic personal scientific skill sets, triangulating the information that we read and consume, maybe learning a little bit about statistics. This kind of citizen science kind of framework that places like the Metcalf Institute are really, really important for, or really the way to go. And so like the epidemics we want to study, there's no easy and quick solutions. We can only conquer it with an ecology of scientific rigor, transparency, and social justice. Thank you so much, Dr. Abunu. Um, and I also just wanted to note that there are a bunch of um, opinion pieces that Dr. Abunu has written recently, I mean, he, he writes opinion pieces often, but especially since the pandemic started, he's been writing a lot and we'll share some of those in the chat too. Um, so um, a question for you right now is about um, kind of like the, the very nature of scientific uncertainty. What, what do you think um, about the process of science um, is something that you wish more people understood as it relates to understanding scientific uncertainties and making sense of them. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I, I think kind of like I talked about ruling things out, right, as opposed to ruling things in. I mean, I think the, the process is really about, the process of science is about shooting down ideas much more than it is building it. I think scientific understanding comes from the elimination of ideas and in and, and, and a disproving of existing paradigms. And I think you should be your, the responsible scientists are their own biggest critic, right? Um, and I think that's the key. So criticism is kind of wired into the basic ascent of understanding. And I think there's all these triumphs um, in, bio, in medicine and other fields from, from that process. Great, thanks. Um, and here's an interesting question that, um, someone asks, they, they said, you know, back to your, your comment about the classic charlatanism, um, and I have a very strong opinion on this, but I'm gonna ask you this question. Uh, do you think that the news media have acted like charlatans? Do I think, okay, so you're asking me to lump the news, I think the news media have been complicit in promoting and propagating charlatanism, yes. yes. How so? Can you, can you kind of broadly um, respond to that? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think because, the head, because they want, I mean, headlines. And I think, I think some of the most provocative headlines come from charlatans, charlatans some, or, as in, or rather some of the most provocative headline worthy stories have come from charlatans. Um, and I think the news media who wants eyeballs and right on, on things, right. They want to lead with these stories. So whether they are that the, there are multiple strains of, 
of SARS-CoV-2 circulating the world and it's evolving in this place or that one. And that's a, that's a cool headline, right? And I think I don't, you know, so I mean, I understand the constraint. I understand the, the profession. That's why it's hard for me to answer that. I understand the professional constraints there. I mean, at the end of the day, I blame the individuals authoring the ideas more, frankly. But, um, but I do think, you know, they have an obligation, particularly uh, journalists in, in the news media have an obligation to, you know, to, to try to negotiate this space responsibly. Right. Yeah, it's a, that's a, we could have a whole <laughs> webinar just about that, that question. Um, and of course, you know, we at Metcalf Institute are big advocates for journalism, but there's, um, but this tension that you've identified between clicks and, um, and depth is, is a really important one. Okay, so we're, a bunch of questions coming in here, but we're going to move on to our final presenter, uh, Susanna Gonzalez from the News Literacy Project, and then we'll come back for a bunch of other questions. Um, okay, so Susanna, take it away. Sorry, bear with me. Thank you, Sunshine and the Metcalf Institute for having me. I am so glad to be here and to be part of this panel. As Sunshine mentioned, my background is in journalism and thinking like a journalist is even more important now amid COVID-19 and with the health and safety of the public at stake. Even before the pandemic, it could be difficult to know what to believe. The news ecosystem has changed and grown tremendously, and we're now faced with the most complex information landscape in history. We not only get news and information from newspapers, television, and radio, but now we also get it from many other places, such as websites, social media, blogs, and podcasts. COVID-19 news and information is coming from many directions. So how can we spot misinformation like a journalist might? And what can we do to actively counter misinformation? First, determine whether what you're encountering is a piece of news or opinion. News reports aim to present information in a fair and accurate way, and they include all relevant sides of a story. News reporters aim to answer the five W's and H, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Also, news articles are timely and they're written on the same day of a news event. This is what journalists call a time peg. If it's a news article, make some key quick observations. For example, take note of the date and time. Articles online often get recycled. And in a news event that is developing, constantly evolving and fluid like COVID-19, it is especially important to verify that the information you're encountering is up to date. By contrast, opinion pieces are meant to show a specific point of view. Opinion pieces from standards-based news organizations are marked with labels such as opinion, column, commentary, editorial, viewpoint, or perspective. Look for these labels. If you see a piece labeled as such, be aware that, that it intends to show a particular point of view. Here are some other ways to think like a journalist. Check it out. There's a saying in journalism, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. This speaks to journalists' skepticism and also the importance of verification or fact-checking. Don't assume that information is accurate and don't take information at face value. Chase facts. Journalists, like scientists, take an evidence-based approach, and journalists remain open to developments and new information. So new facts can change a story and lead it in a new direction. When you encounter information you're unsure of, take steps to verify its accuracy. Check to see if reputable news organizations are reporting the same information or verify that the, inf that the information um, comes from original sourcing, such as official documents that are available online or statements from public officials. Another way to think like a journalist is to consider the source. 
Ask yourself, is the person or entity providing information trustworthy and reliable? Do they have the authority to speak about the subject? Also, what's their motivation? If it's not immediately clear who they are, do a quick, do a quick search on the source before accepting that the information they are providing is true. I'll share an example from a recent family Zoom call. A relative announced that Kim Jong-un had died. I asked, what's your source? The relative replied, TMZ. I saw that TMZ alert also and did a search to see if major standards-based news organizations were reporting the same thing. They weren't and current reports from standards-based news organizations now say that he is alive. It is important to consider the source. Journalists at standards-based news organizations follow a set of ethical guidelines that are made public. The Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics is a good resource, and this Code of Ethics can easily be found online. If you're unsure whether a source is standards-based, do a search for their guidelines and take notice and be wary about sources that don't have such guidelines in place. If a source runs corrections, that is a good sign. As a journalist, I hated to have to run a correction, but corrections along with clarifications and editor's notes are signs of credibility. They signal that the source is transparent about its mistakes, that it holds itself accountable and is committed to the truth and setting the record straight. The last key way to think like a journalist is to seek all relevant sides of a story for balance. News journalists present you with all relevant perspectives of a story so that you as a reader or listener or viewer or decision maker can come to your own judgment and opinion about a matter. Pursuing all relevant perspectives would provide a broader view and a more balanced understanding of an issue. Here's a quick example from a recent issue of the SIFT. This, this image claimed to show a mass burial site for people who had died from COVID-19. However, this is false and actually shows a scene from the trailer for the 2011 movie, Contagion. This image and claim were shared on Facebook and Twitter hundreds of times. If I were encountering an image like this that I wasn't sure about, I would closely evaluate the post's source and take note of the date and time. I would also look at the comments to see if questions were being raised about the post's accuracy and if there was a fact check posted. In the absence of a source, just as I asked my relative who said Kim Jong-un had died, inquire further and highlight questionable sourcing and claims. Thinking like a journalist can help you to navigate this so-called infodemic. It will help you sort fact from fiction. It will help you to be more informed so that you can be in a stronger position to make good decisions. Thinking like a journalist will also give you a better understanding of the news gathering process, take part in conversations about journalism, and hold news organizations accountable to their own standards. I'd like to point uh, quickly to two useful news literacy project infographics. The first is this how to know what to trust infographic, which details steps you can take to determine whether you can believe a claim. It is available at this link. And I'd also recommend our Sanitize Before You Share infographic, which is on our website, newslit.org. This infographic shows four quick steps you can take to stop the spread of misinformation. In the same amount of time that we're advised to wash our hands, 20 seconds, we can debunk information. Step one, pause. Be aware if you're having a strong reaction to a piece of information, and if you are, the piece of information may very well be misinformation that be as it as misinformation is designed to make you have a strong reaction. Step two, glance at the comments. Look for a link to credible information, to a fact check, or if people are raising questions about the claims credibility. 
Step three, do a quick search. Just as I did with TMZ's Kim Jong-un alert, search to see if credible sources are reporting the same information. Step four, ask for the source. If there is no source of information, then don't share it. Also inquire further and highlight questionable sourcing and claims, as I mentioned earlier. If you find evidence that a claim is not true, alert others. If you still aren't sure, don't share it. Because if you share information that turns out not to be true, there are possible effects down the line. The people you share that misinformation with could have shared it with others. Be a proactive sharer of credible information instead. Thank you so much, Susanna. That was a, a fantastic summary and um, a really useful um, connection that you made between thinking like a journalist and thinking like a scientist. And um, it would be great if you could talk a little bit more about that connection and kind of how you learned as a journalist, um, how you came to understand that, that you as a journalist and scientists thought similarly. Well, it, you know, it's a conversation that I was having with um, my colleague, uh, Carol, actually, um, that it is, um, it, it's true scientists and journalists are similar in that way. We are looking for facts. We are looking for truth and we base our work on, on those uh, pieces of evidence and, and, and facts. Um, and uh, we also uh, are moving and uh, moving with develops, uh, with, with facts as, as they're developing, as they're um, becoming apparent to us. And um, we are continually, continually having to move and shift the story um, to go where the information takes us. Right, right, yep. And that's, so this is a very common theme that we've been hearing among all of our speakers today. Um, there's a, a question here that um, I think everyone on the panel could respond to, but I'd like to start with Leisha Palin. Um, someone commented on the fact that recycling happens so much on social media. And yeah. they said, you know, I've flagged stories that attributed things to COVID-19 that actually happened previously. And of course, um, there was the, the example that Susanna just shared from um, Contagion, for example. And I thought this could be an interesting opportunity for you to show um, the tool that you were showing me earlier, Leisha, um, that just kind of gives a sense of how information is shared on Twitter, for example. Right. So let me, so I will do that. Um, I think the particular data I have up here won't sh answer that question in particular, but, 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 but it will help show what we call these um, Twitter signatures um, and how they are Hold on one little second here. Um, how they are, um, how long they live. So one moment here. There we go. Okay. So, so that question was a really hard one. I saw it come up and I, it, was, it was hard to answer in text. So I chose not to, but it does deserve a lot of time. Um, let me, let me, so let me show you this um, tool that uh, our lab developed for the purposes of looking at this hazard. And that's actually something that's kind of interesting is that the information space of every event is so different that we have to have different ways of looking at the kinds of behaviors that are happening there. But this is just, this is, um, these are tweets the CDC sent out and this shows how much they're retweeted. Now this doesn't get to the particular examples that our um, audience members shared around the tractor thing, but we might, we might imagine like how much traction that tractor tweet got by looking at a signature like this. So what you're looking at here are, um, let's look at some, let's zoom in right here first because this other stuff is a little bit distracting. These are tweets issued by the CDC. They start down at the start of each of these little worm-like curves um, and each of the dots show how who retweeted it and the, the size of dots sort of show how 
big an influencer that person was, but it's not a dramatic shift. So it's hard to discern very much, but you can discern something. So you can see that a tweet here um, began, you know, on April 19th or so, uh, just before, and you can see that here it gets a jump in volume of attention if you're looking over on the y axis. So it goes from, you know, 750,000 sort of eyes on it or retweets. Um, and then there's an influencer here. We can see who that is. And this is uh, somebody with uh, 427,000 followers. And so we get a, a jump on that tweet in terms of um, how much attention it gets. And so um, it's hard to do a deep analysis here, you know, live without looking at each one of these. But let me show you two more things that we can learn from this, this, this tweet, uh, this display. So here you see a bunch of curves that actually started down here, but it's hard to see them because this y-axis is such, a, such high volume. It goes from zero to 100 million. And a lot of tweets don't ever get that high in terms of retweeting. But what happened here is a major influencer came in and started retweeting these. And so the number of people who saw it gets much higher, but then its curve, you know, this accumulation curve continues to be about the same as say these others. Well, in each of these cases, these were all places where um, Trump, who's, you know, a very significant influencer, um, as you can see here up on the top, I can't point to it at the same time and hold on to it, but above the graph, it says user real Donald Trump. He's got how many followers? what is that, 78 million, am I reading that right? And so of course you get a gigantic jump and then, you, then the tweet gets a new life up here. You can start looking at, so we expect to see that. You can start looking at curious things in these curves by looking at say this tweet, this blue tweet here, and looking at what it's doing. This, if you look at the text just above the chart again, this is all about the household cleaners and disinfectants. So the CDC after uh, Trump um, mused aloud about the possibilities of disinfectants. They're coming in and saying this isn't this isn't an effective use of, um, or uh, this is a dangerous use of such uh, chemicals. And so it gets it just skyrockets up, right? Compared to all the other still high volume tweets they get, they get a lot of attention on their tweets. Five million is a lot. So it skyrockets out. But of course, we're all sleeping in the U.S. at this time, and so we wake up again. This is all UTC. And when, when, the, when, it, when the US wakes up, it gets another big shot up. Um, and so it has a, a high volume of attention and it lives on for a very long time in tweet land, many, many days. So this is one way in which we can look at things like how much a piece of misinformation is getting traction. It's one way of looking at it. Um, I could say more uh, about the other stuff, but maybe that's enough to, to leave others to give something to say here. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I, I really just wanted everyone to get a chance to see one of the tools that you use um, in informatics to try to make sense of this massive volume of information on social media and figure out who's influencing whom, etc. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, so lots of questions coming in right now. Um, and um, this is one again that I think all of you could respond to. Do you have any guidance for teachers having discussions with students about when experts are the ones who are producing or perpetuating misinformation? How do we address this without undermining trust in a scientific process? So maybe Dr. Obuna, you could take this one. It's a great question. I saw that one and I started responding and I was like, well, let me, let me not. Uh, so, um, the, 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 what I would say to that, it's a great, great question. It's not an easy question to answer. What I would do or what I do in that context is use history, use history, right? I think history gives some good examples of how debate is a normal part of science. You can go back to Lamarck versus Darwin. You can go about spontaneous generation. You can go about, I mean, luminaries have debated ideas and some of them have been just flatly wrong, like just wrong like wrong and, and allowed kind of misinformation to kind of perpetuate their own thinking. So otherwise intelligent people have had agendas. So I think using history as a way to demonstrate that I think is, would, would, would be my quick and uh, e the, the easiest answer to that very complicated and excellent question. Right, thank you. Um, does anyone else, Susanna or, or Dr. Palin have any thoughts on that? I would just, um, um, 
encourage uh, to take a look at our weekly newsletter, The Sift, uh, which uh, takes uh, teachable moments um, from recent news events. And we include in our items discussion points um, uh, and ideas for, for students. So that might be useful for you. It's free. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, another question here. Any, and we're gonna kind of continue on this theme. Any advice for helping to quote unquote convince people, this is how the question is written. Um, any advice for helping to convince people we know to trust credible news sources? I have encountered many who ignore reliable news sources altogether because they believe they are quote unquote fake news. Um, and so these are, so there are many people who are just completely resistant to trusting, again, the quote unquote mainstream news. It's hard to get them not to spread misinformation when um, they're not willing to act rationally, writes this person. Any responses to that? This is a great question, a common question, and one that I faced even when I was working as a reporter. Um, you know, I, I would just, if you're a person uh, encountering this claim that's being uh, told or uh, seen, I would uh, just encourage you to ask the person questions. What's your source? Um, uh, where did this information come from? And again, I would point to the, um, the set of guidelines that uh, journalists, that journalists strive to follow in every step of their work. Um, not all, uh, not all groups or age or organizations follow guidelines, and that's something to be acknowledged. Other thoughts on that? <laughs> complicated, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, complicated. I think getting, getting, getting people to believe in the institution of evidence, uh, you know, in the institution of science is a, is a very complicated thing. So I don't know if I have a, I don't, I don't feel right giving a quick answer to that person. Yeah, so I'm not sure I have something really functional to say here because I struggle mm -hmm. with this in my own circles. And I guess I, I guess I feel I'm looking at some of the questions that are in the chat window about like even really um, investigative journalism that is really striving to get at the, the truth of the story. It's such a confused, it's such a difficult space that it's hard to know and even that can be wrong. But I'll tell you, I will, I would follow the pursuit of truth, even when it gets a little bit wrong, m more than those who are sort of, um, sort of just not respecting that as, as, the, as the benchmark for the standard. How, how do we get other people to also have that as a value um, and to have that appeal to, to reason? I, I, I really, I really don't know. I'm sorry. Well, and I'll add that this is not a, this is not a new sort of question, of course. This is something that has come up a lot uh, in climate change communication. Yeah. Um, and the, the issue of, of trusted messengers and, and talking about climate change mm -hmm. impacts and approaches in ways that um, that is relevant to people is something that there are a lot of there are a lot of people working on this all over the world so I think um, what we have seen here is that there's a lot to be learned um, across disciplines across um, you know types of, of science and, and types of science communication that we could all be implementing more effectively um, in a crisis like this one we're experiencing right now. If I could say an observation I'm making, as you were speaking, Sunshine, I realized I had additional thought on this, which is that, you know, there are those who deny climate change, and then there are many who say, well, you know what, you can spend your time trying to change their mind, or you can build a boat and save them for when you have to. And I think that's, there's something interesting in that. But with a pandemic, we need them all to believe because we are ourselves the hazard because we are the host for the hazard and so this is really a time to, that where it's worth fighting the denial of reason and the denial of you know truth and science even when it's mistaken uh because we need them to believe that we're all in the same boat in this case all the same storm as i think solnit just recently talked about so yeah 
Yeah. Right. Uh, again, as in the, the lead into this entire conversation today, right, this is a very challenging problem, um, not least because of all these uncertainties. So another great question here, does the use of the word literacy in reference to science, technological, media, or information literacy make those who, quote, aren't literate walk away from efforts to, quote, make them literate? If so, how can we better approach public education? And I'm going to amend that and say even public engagement. Um, how do you all respond to that, that question? Uh, I, I don't I don't think I use the, the term scientific literacy and I don't think I, I mean I, I have never thought about it critically that way so thank you for bringing that to my attention um, but but I don't think I use it for whatever reason and perhaps in perhaps somewhere in my head I think the same way you do that I think it's 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 kind of not the right it's it's too stigmatizing so I you know um so I don't know I can't answer your question because I don't think I use it but I can I can certainly see I can certainly see that being stigmatizing and uh, counterproductive Any other thoughts? Okay, we'll move on. We've got more questions to go. Um, do you think journalists are being skeptical slash analytical slash questioning enough on the sort of let's be brave aspect of the pandemic? That is, should we be more skeptical about mask behavior, closing of parks, mental health and supermarkets, et cetera? Hmm. So skeptical, sorry, can you just clarify in the sense of they should, they should, they, are they questioning, should we follow like the Sweden model or something like this? Um, yeah, so that's a good clarification. Um, we can see if the question asker will submit something else to clarify a little bit, but, but my read on this is, um, We, given the fact that the information, back to something that you said earlier, Alicia, you know, the information's changing so quickly and it gets old really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so, given the fact that, that some of the recommendations that are coming are sometimes coming um, and then changing fairly quickly, like the mask example is, is mm -hmm. one of those, right? So, the, I think the, the question means, um, do you all feel that, that the reporting on this has been sufficiently analytical with regard to the messages that, that we're receiving about how to respond to the pandemic at a given moment? Um, or should the reporting be a, a little bit more skeptical? Um, mm -hmm. and, and if so, how or why? So, so I'll just say, I think, I think it should be more critical than it has been. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, if we're attending to the messaging that people are getting in other countries, like in South Korea is sort of my, one of my lookouts. Um, I, I don't know. So I was much more aware as an individual of preparation for the pandemic earlier in February because I was watching what my colleagues in South Korea were doing. I thought, why aren't we doing this here? And so I don't, I think one way to be, I, I changed the word from skeptical to critical just so I could answer the question a little bit better for myself. But what I, what I don't quite understand is why we aren't um, examining the American response and the American risk communications with what plenty of other places are doing. It seems like there's enough, there, one can be critical simply by triangulating to see what else is happening elsewhere and then really question is this what we should be doing right now are we missing something are we being too concerned are we not being concerned enough um and i i i i, I feel like i don't hear a lot enough of that to be satisfying to me um i just wanted to add uh you know journalists are working currently under very um uh, very difficult circumstances. And it is, um, it's important to note that, you know, a news organization is not only um, trying to analyze events, but is also trying to provide 
straight news reports on what's happening and as they're happening, as well as offer opinions. So, you know, journalists play many roles in, in, um, uh, in, in this context. And, you know, in many newsrooms, uh, especially local newsrooms, um, are unfortunately um, taking a, a, a huge hit from uh, the fallout of um, COVID-19 with the loss of advertising revenue. Um, you know, and I would just encourage, you know, you as a, a consumer of news and information, if you're not seeing um, the analysis that you crave, you know, seek out uh, seek out a, um, a varied news diet and, um, and think critically on your own and make, come to your own decisions. You know, um, I, I think that uh, is, is an important point to make, especially in this climate of infodemic. Thank you so much for that comment, Susanna. That's the really important points. Um, and while I, that's a perfect place for us to end, I, there's one last question that I'd like to um, throw out there for all the panelists to address. Um, and that is that, um, so the person says that Susanna mentioned the importance of seeking all relevant sides for balance. And of course, the point you just made again, Susanna, having a, a varied news diet is such a good way to do this. Um, what do you all think might be ways to, to navigate um, navigate the importance of seeking these different sources while avoiding, avoiding any sense of false balance or giving a platform to charlatans, as, as Dr. Obunu mentioned before. What are your thoughts on that, each of you, really quickly, just to kind of wrap up here? I'll give a quick example. Um, when I was a, a doing research for uh, for a piece that I wrote in the SIFT recently. Um, you know, this, this idea of um, othering COVID-19 and um, the discrimination that Asian Americans have faced um, as a result of uh, public officials um, associating the virus with uh, China and Chinese people. Um, and a, a scholar, um, in San Francisco uh, made a point in a recent interview uh, with the Columbia uh, Journalism Review that um, news reports, um, at least early on, were not um, sharing, sharing the perspective of Asian Americans and that he was really seeing a lack of that. Um, and so I would just encourage as a consumer of news and information to if if to really seek out these perspectives, you know, to, to seek out the voices that you might not see in a, in a news report, for example. Great. For me, it, it goes again to some attention to what's happening internationally, because unlike most any other disaster, we are all experiencing this. And each nation state is a grand experiment in how things are going. And so I find it really helpful to read, you know, an authoritative source from different places to understand what is happening there. Like, why is Denmark reopening their schools? Oh, and they're not really reopening them. They're doing this small kind of reopening. And that really helps me understand, um, develop a kind of, again, a triangulation around what might be the range of possibilities that we should be thinking about. And that helps me understand the American response in a larger context. Great, thanks. And, Brandon, you get the last word here. Okay, and, and briefly, I mean, I think all sidesism is, is also a very, very big problem when it comes to this thing. And um, I think any, any kind of, uh, any idea that's grounded in anti-intellectualism or, or by an institution that is rooted in attacking the institution of intellectualism is not one of the sides that needs to be considered when we talk about seeing things from all these different sides. So those, like I said, need to be eliminated from the discourse right, right away. And I think that, that helps the problem because now that shrinks the number of things that you're having to sort through in order to kind of triangulate the information that you're getting. Great. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining us today for this conversation. I know everyone um, 
who's joined us. We really appreciate you being here too. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. There's a lot to cover in this particular topic. Um, but thanks again to everyone for, uh, for joining us in today's webinar um, or in the previous webinars and to each of our speakers. Um, I also want to thank the News Literacy Project for partnering with us um, to do this series. And I wanted to note finally that you can find these videos um, on Metcalf Institute's YouTube channel. And um, I think that there is a link shared in the chat. And um, we look forward to seeing you again at a future, a future webinar. Everybody take care, be safe, and have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.